Okay, and share the screen. Okay, you're supposed to see the screen now. So um, what we discussed last time was uh, uh, is implementation of uh, LDA, basically this is density functional theory for atom. And today we are going to finish this uh, this part, and then you will uh, finish the, you finish this for the homework. So basically, the next homework uh, will be to put together uh, all these parts that we discussed up to now and calculate uh, total energy and total charge density for a uh, uh, multi-electron atom. Uh, so I stopped here when we when. Uh, uh, I discussed this uh, mesh for uh, for finding bound states. So it turns out that it, this uh, particular mesh for finding bound states is a bit tricky uh, in uh, generic uh, multi-electron uh, atom. And sometimes you need to tweak this a little bit to get convergence for heavier atoms. Uh, but of course, when the number of points uh, becomes large, then uh, any mesh should be should be good. Um, so here we have the implementation that we're going to go through uh, right now, and this is something that I uh, expect from you to uh, do for the homework. Okay, so put this together so it's going to work. Now um, the the precision of the calculation. Uh, has to be reasonable in the sense that we have benchmark results on the NIST webpage, which you can access as well. And uh, you can uh, open that and see what are what is the energy of 1S state, what is the energy of 2S state, what is the energy of three, 2P states, and what's the total energy. And uh, I want you to get at least few significant digits. Um, I mean, uh, this particular implementation that I uh, will present will actually have all significant digits that uh, exist on the NIST web page. Uh, but uh, even if you don't get all, should be OK, but at least you should get some. Um, OK, so um, what do we do? First, uh, my uh, um, mesh here has to be, uh, for R, has to be uh, uniform because otherwise numero will not work as we discussed. And I decided here to start uh, mesh at 10 to the minus eight uh, and uh, go to 20. Uh, it turns out that if you go to larger R, larger than 20, the, the precision doesn't increase, doesn't improve because it seems that the atoms, well, at least when Z is of the order of eight or 10, uh, the atoms are still relatively uh, sh sh uh, contained in a relatively small uh, R, so 20 is enough. Of course, when you go to heavier atoms, when you go maybe to 20, uh, Z is 20, you will need to increase this a little bit. Uh, then um, the number of points that I took is 2 to the power of 14 plus 1 in the R space, so it's a relatively large number of points, but we know that uh, uh, numero is pretty fast, so even for this uh, 10,000 uh, points, it's uh, it's almost instant. Uh, so I'm currently solving this for uh, oxygen because Z is 8. And here uh, is this mixing parameter. So uh, mixing parameter can be any number between 0 and 1. Of course, 1 means that uh, we don't mix at all. We always take the new solution. Uh, uh, when this mixing parameter is zero, it means that we are taking, uh, we are, well, if mixing parameter becomes very, very small, it means that we are taking very, very small uh, contribution of the newest of the new solution uh, at every time. And this is, in, this is useful when the convergence is very hard to obtain. Um, but uh, in all the atoms that we are going to uh, test, a mixing of uh, half is pretty reasonable in the sense that half of the old solution and half of the new solution works pretty well. Uh, then um, this is the this is the uh, um, a smash for uh, finding all the bound states. Uh, and as I discussed last time, it seems important that you allow the bound states to slightly to become slightly positive sometimes. So it's a good idea to to shift this 
uh, this uh, energy to slightly positive energy of, of, of one half or something. I mean, it doesn't need to be one half. It's enough to be 0.1 as long as it's, um, it's slightly, it's allowed to be slightly positive. Uh, then here, this n max is the parameter of how many, um, how many um, um, uh, bound states we need uh, for the s state. So basically, three means one s, two s, and three s states. So this is definitely enough for oxygen, and uh, it's enough for even heavier atoms. If we go to uh, uh, to uh, uh, to this table, we, we clearly see that uh, periodic table, we clearly see this is enough for, for hydrogen, probably is enough for, uh, well, for nickel, it's probably not enough because in this case, we need 4S as well. But um, uh, it's definitely enough for those that, that have, that have uh, 2S or 3S. Um, so when you go to heavier atoms, you need to increase this N max, doesn't it? So uh, we are gonna, the algorithm is gonna be such that uh, for uh, n is equal to zero, we are gonna search for three bound states. And for uh, n is equal to one, we look at two bound states. And for n is equal to two, we look at one bound state. Okay, so and no Fs in this case. When n max is four, we're gonna use four, uh, uh, L, four, uh, uh, bound states for L is equal to zero, three bound states for L is equal to one, and so on and so forth. Um, so now this uh, EXT is exchange correlation uh, uh, class, uh, which uh, is going to give us uh, the exchange and the correlation energy like before. And then we start uh, the iterations always with uh, setting this U consham to minus two. Here, this minus two times one of so R means minus two for every R, isn't it? For every point uh, in R mesh, this is minus two. So this is exactly equivalent to starting with the hydrogen hydrogen atom. Why? Because this U con sham is the quantity that enters into Schrodinger equation, which is written here, yeah? So you see this quantity here, this quantity here is U con sham. So when this quantity here is set to minus two, that's exactly the same as setting heart rate and exchange correlation to zero and setting Z to one, okay? So basically starting with hydrogen atom. So at the very first iteration, you should get the first bound state to be minus one, isn't it? Because we are starting with hydrogen atom. Um, okay, I mean, this is not, it's, you could start differently, but I think this is a convenient starting point. So we start with a hydrogen atom. Uh, then we're going to set here uh, old and old total energy just to zero. It doesn't matter, some arithmetic number. And then we're going to say that the tolerance for the total energy. So once the total energy doesn't change anymore, so the change is less than ten to the minus seven, then we can break out of the loop. So this is what this etol means. It means the to tolerance for the change in total energy in the loop. Okay, and so then we iterate. Uh, this um, self consistent loop for some large number of times. In this case, I wrote 100. Uh, sometimes we need maybe larger number, so we could easily put this to 1000, but don't exaggerate. Um, now uh, we are going to have a break statement here. You see, if the change of the total energy is smaller than this tolerance, we're going to break anyway. So therefore, this uh, number of iterations is ir irrelevant in first approximation. This is just to make sure that we don't have an infinite loop. So if you, if by some chance your uh, algorithm has a bug and you write here some very large number, you might uh, suffer through uh, a very lo very long loop, which you probably not probably not uh, not uh, a good idea. Okay. So then the entire algorithm is of course contained in these few lines here. So let me walk you through uh, so that you understand what uh, what's going on. Um, it's basically the uh, putting together all the steps that we discussed before. So the first uh, three lines uh, calculate the bound state energies. So with this found bound state, which is the shooting method, um, uh, look at here that the number of uh, be careful that the number of uh, required bound states is n max minus L. So we said for L is equal to zero, 
we calculate n max bound states for, for, for L is equal to one, we calculate n max minus one and so on and so forth bound states. And the reason for this is because we know that in periodic table, the feeling uh, is such that uh, S states feels first and then P, uh, 2P is typically filled after 2S state, for example. Okay, and um, yeah, we, we are using here the Kornsham uh, potential, uh, which is uh, at the beginning uh, set to a hydrogen like atom and later on it's going to be updated. Uh, so once we have these bound states, we sort them uh, with, uh, with sorting method in such a way that we just compare total energies in this case, total energies, uh, no, sorry, bound state energies. And this is just fine, bound, comparing bound state energies. It turns out that all the degeneracies are gone when we uh, switch on the interactions. So in the directing system, the, the, the gener you don't need to take care of the degeneracy because they are uh, accident degeneracies disappear. Um, then we calculate the charge density uh, in, uh, with the algorithm that we implemented above which needs the bound state energies uh, and uh, this u consham, uh, consham potential. And this gives us the new charge density and the sum of all uh, bound state energies, okay? Now, this new charge density is something that we could just take as the best approximation for the charge density at each iteration. But we don't do that, we mix it because it turns out in mixing, uh, typically works much better than taking the new approximation for the charge density. So what does mixing means? Well, it means that uh, typically we're going to take uh, rho to be uh, rho nu times some number mix r, which can be between zero and one. Uh, small number means we're going to take only very little of the new charge density. Uh, and a lot of the old charge density is that one minus mix R of the old charge density. Okay, so that's how we mix. So the current row is a little bit of the new one and a lot of the old one. Uh, of course, in the first iteration, we need to do something else. We always, do, in the first iteration, we always take the new charge density because we don't have a good approximation for the old charge density. Or basically, row old is not defined yet. And then we need to make sure that this row old here is a copy of the current row. Um, well, this copy is actually important because if we don't do it this way, uh, we are not going to have two different densities in your in our memory, uh, which is the current and the new. So if you don't do the copy copying, you might have a problem that we are going to you're going to row new is going to be the same as row. And that's going to be a problem, isn't it? So uh, copy just ensures that we have two different memory, two different memory, memories um, uh, that uh, in uh, that that don't interact with each other. Okay, so uh, this is the mixing. So very simple. Then um, then we we calculate the Hartree potential on uh, our new charge density on so-called output charge density. Uh, and then uh, once we have our heart three, we can also calculate exchange correlation potential, just as exactly as we did before, uh, by calling this um, e, e exchange correlation class. Uh, we add together correlation and exchange part. Um, they both need RS rather than charge density, but we know that from charge density, it's very easy to calculate RS. And then this is what we need to add, give to this class. Now, the factor of two here is because of the units. We said that we are using Rydbergs rather than Hartree's. So the regional implementation is in Hartree's and the difference is factor of two. So again, two is just because of units. And once, then we once we have um, uh, the Kornstrom potential V, uh, we uh, can uh, construct again the new approximation for u consham, which is uh, the Hartree part plus the interaction with the nucleus times plus the exchange correlation part. So um, this is exactly as we did before. So again, uh, this is not V, this is U. I mean, potential. Uh, the, the difference between potential and this U quantity is that U is potential times R, isn't that potential times R because it is more convenient thing for numerics uh, to use. So we have the Hartree part, this minus two 
z atom is just the interaction between electron and uh, and uh, um, and the nucleus, and then uh, is the V exchange correlation part, which we need to multiply by R because this is actually exchange correlation potential rather than the so-called U function. Okay, so. Uh, then once we once we have all these quantities, we can evaluate total energy, and this is the algorithm for total energy. Now, uh, in order to understand this, we're going to go back into the formula that we derived. So this is the formula that we derived uh, uh, last time. Okay, so that's what we are we are implementing. So the um, the the total energy is first sum over all occupied bound states. Okay, plus this 3D integral. Okay, 3D integral, which of course we can be written in terms of one dimensional integral or space or, or R variable. Okay, so uh, we need uh, E exchange correlation minus V exchange correlation. So energy density minus potential. And then we multiply with rho and integrate over 3D. And then we also need the Hartree part. Okay, so that's what we're going to implement. And uh, notice that. This minus e heart rate, this e heart rate is actually one half of v heart rate, doesn't it? So I could write here instead of minus e heart rate, uh, one half of v heart rate. Okay, so that's what we're going to implement. So let's see what is here. So we are, we are, we are calculating ECVC. So ECVC turns out to be uh, energy density minus potential. Okay, so that's something that um, that you have to remember. So ECVC, it turns out it's it's the difference between uh, energy energy density minus potential. Okay, the difference is called in the code ECVC. Okay, turns out that's uh, that's that's convenient thing to calculate the difference rather than the each of them separately. It's faster to calculate the difference. Turns out. Okay, so this ECVC again is the correlation part, and then EXVX is the exchange part. So the two together are the, the are exchange correlation minus V exchange correlation. So energy density minus potential. Okay, so this part EXC, VXC is given now in Rydberg because of factor of two. And this is exactly this part. E exchange correlation minus V exchange correlation. Okay, so keep in mind that this difference is just this quantity, EXC, VXC. And then what do we need to add to this? Well, this EXC, VXC needs to be multiplied with the uh, with the volume with the volume uh, element. What is the volume uh, times density, of course? So density is rho, and then the volume is four pi. R square and then dr, of course, because we are going to integrate over r. So you see here we have four pi r, one r, and then other r, which is four pi r square, um, and uh, n times rho. Okay, so this is for the exchange correlation part. And now this part here, the second part, is the Hartree part. And as we said, the, the this minus one half comes from the fact that the Exchange correlation density is one half of the potential. Is that so? We are basically this, uh, uh, taking half of the potential out. Half of the potential is that uh, again. This is because we need to take minus e heart rate, and e heart rate is one half of v heart rate. Is that so? Therefore, it's half of the potential. Okay. So half of the potential. So now this quantity here is exactly. Um, uh, this quantity in the brackets, isn't that? So we subtracted the heart rate out, we have exchange correlation part, and we have rho of r and also d to the three r, which is four pi r square in this case, isn't it? So all we need to do then now is to integrate this over one dimension over, over r. And uh, this is gonna be done with Simpson method in this case. So Simpson method uh, will integrate over those uh, points uh, in, in uh, uh, in uh, mesh R, and we're going to get the potential part, and then we add to this. All we need to do is to add all the bound state energies, EBS, and EBS. You see, is computed here when we calculate charge density. Okay, so when charge densities were calculated, 
we got at the same time also the current best approximation for um, for the sum of the uh, bound state energies. And if we put them together, we get what we call E dot total energy. Okay, so this is this this is then the entire expression here. Okay, so this is total energy. Um, now. This, this total energy is, of course, the total energy of the, on the current charge density. And uh, we are going to check how different is this from the previous total energy. So uh, here we're going to say, uh, we're going to check what is the E total energy minus, e minus, minus previous total energy, which we called E old. And when the absolute value of this is less than tolerance, which is 10 to the minus 7, we're going to break out of the loop. Of course, we shouldn't break out of the loop if accidentally the first iteration, the two are equal, but that shouldn't happen. But uh, it's a good idea to check that. And uh, well, we need to make sure that once we once we uh, make this comparison, then we can we can set uh, that old energy is now current total energy. So this is going to be useful in the next iteration. And then, in addition to this, all we're going to do is to print some information. So. Um, here we uh, always check uh, that, the, that the weight of the total dens density, when we integrate the total density over space, we get uh, Z. This is just a sanity check that uh, uh, we did not uh, screw up Z when we mixed the charge density, because in principle, when we mix charge density, we might um, make uh, an error. Um, and uh, then uh, this, this uh, print, out here is a bit more useful, so it gives a bit more information. So the iteration number, then total energy in Rydbergs, then we give total energy in heart trees. So because the heart trees is uh, the same as Rydberg divided by two, heart trees are twice as big unit, uh, and then the difference between iterations. Okay, um, so let me run this code. Um, okay, so oops. Yeah, still running, but it's close to be converged. Oh, it's a problem with this. No, 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 no. Okay, so now it's converged. Now let me go back to the beginning. Yeah, so when the output is large, then, uh, then, uh, uh, so how this is uh, con condensed into, into, uh, into, uh, um, Condensed window. So in the first iteration, uh, we see that the uh, bound state energies were corresponding to the uh, hydrogen atom uh, because the uh, ground state energy is minus one. Next one is minus one half, and so on. Uh, so um, then uh, we were adding those bound state energies, and we got the total weight of the density to be charged, which is which is eight. Uh, and of course, the charge density, the difference in the total energy was huge at the beginning. So, and then at the next iteration, it would increase a little bit, and then it started to decrease. So soon it was, it went uh, to 50, and then 19, and then four, and next one was 0.6. And then if we go so so quickly down to something less than one, then we see we're on good track: 0 0.3, 0 0.15, 0 0.03, 0 0.018, and so on. And within a few iterations, you see we have every iteration gives you gives you almost one more one more digit. So soon we get to ten to the minus five, and so on. And then a few more iterations, and we get ten to the minus ten to the minus eight. So less than ten to the minus seven, and then we can break. So it turns out that we needed uh, in this case we needed uh, twenty eight iterations. Um, the total total density has weight eight just like we needed because Z is eight in this case. And now the sanity check. So the very important check is whether our code works. Uh, total energy in heart trees uh, can be now directly compared with the uh, with, uh, um, NIST database. So let's do that. So NIST database here uh, says that the total energy within LDA should be Minus seventy four point four seven three zero seven seven. Okay, remember this number seven four four seven three zero seven seven. Our current value is minus seventy four point four seven three zero seven sixty nine, which is the same as seven. 
Okay, so in other words, we have all significant digits that are in the NIST database. Okay, so in other words, the, the system, we don't have a systematic error or the systematic error is smaller than what uh, is uh, available in the, in the NIST database. So uh, we can also check the bound state energies. So one S state is supposed to be uh, minus 18.758245. So our one is minus 18.758244449, which is four, five, I guess, four, five, yeah, okay? So all digits are correct. And two S stated minus 0 0.871362, 0 0.71362, one. So yeah, this is like two. And then finally, two P, 0.338, 381, 0.3383807, which is the same as one. Okay, so basically all the digits that were all the quantities that are uh, no all the digits that are available uh, in the NIST web page uh, are uh, the same as what we get. So for all the bound states and for total energy. We didn't calculate here, we didn't break the total energy into, con into contributions of kinetic energy, co Coulomb energy, uh, nuclear energy, exchange correlation energy. We could easily do that. These are just components of the total energy that we're calculating anyway. Um, but, um, but currently, uh, I mean, if, if we get the total energy right, all the rest has to be right, have to be right as well. So what is your homework then? Well. Your homework is to get um, similar uh, similar results. So you need to get uh, a total energy which agrees with the NIST web page. Uh, it doesn't need to be doesn't need to have all the digits, but uh, I mean I guess it needs to have one, two, three, four significant digits or something like that. Um, uh, yeah, maybe uh, here in hard freeze, of course. Uh, so as long as it's roughly correct, it should be okay. I mean, I understand that um, that uh, if you um, have slightly less precise mesh or slightly different cutoff, you might get a digit one or two digits less, but uh, otherwise it should work. Uh, and then um, if you feel that this uh, homework is too easy for you, uh, what you can do is you can uh, uh, change uh, Z atom, okay? And uh, you, should, you, should, you should check this anyway, that it works for a few uh, light atoms. So it's very easy to get it to work for helium uh, or, um, well, all uh, atoms that appear before oxygen. And it's also very easy to go up to neon because basically we're just filling the same orbital, isn't it? Up to neon, as far as I understand, it's completely trivial. Um, and uh, then it gets a little bit more trickier. I think there's sodium, uh, magnesium. It can fail sometimes. You, you might need to tune this, um, uh, this parameter for finding bound states. Um, but uh, it should be still pretty, pretty easy to get all 3D, 3Ds. So if you tune a little bit, you would be able to get all these 3D elements and all the way up to uh, uh, selenium and uh, I think uh, Krypton should be okay. But uh, then when it gets to heavier, so I mean, I, I remember that uh, numerics become a bit more trickier. So, because the, the trouble is that you have then uh, some orbitals which, uh, which extend to a very large R and some which are very, which have a lot of, um, a lot of details at small r. So in other words, um, different orbitals would need to have uh, different mesh. So basically it would be more convenient if we break up the mesh in such a way that each orbital or some set of orbitals would have some type of mesh and different orbitals would have different type of mesh. So um, when you go to heavier atoms. So therefore um, uh, it gets a bit more trickier. All the alternatives of course to use many more, many more R points. Um, but of course, this also gets a bit harder when you use uh, when you use Python. Um, but nevertheless, you should be able to do um, at least uh, light elements uh, easily with uh, just slightly tuning these parameters. So, therefore, I hope that for the homework uh, you can you can try to uh, implement this for oxygen and maybe if you 
a few other atoms, you try for a few other atoms and you see how it works and uh, um, send me your solution. Okay, is it uh, clear? All more clear? Okay, so let's give the uh, deadline one week from now. Huh? So next uh, Wednesday, uh, which would be, so today's 24. So that would be 31st. So the last of March, just before the April's full day. Um, you can please you submit this homework. Okay. Um, so with this, we are concluding uh, this chapter on um, on, uh, uh, on on programming in Python. Uh, and next uh, uh, subject that I wanna wanna talk about is uh, Monte Carlo. So five oh nine. Uh, so I prepared here a random numbers Monte Carlo methods and simulated annealing. This is what we're gonna do. Um, yeah, I see that there is a question. Uh, would we post lecture recording? So lecture recordings are on YouTube. Uh, I'm updating a uh, YouTube channel. So lots of uh, students are um, uh, subscribed to YouTube, but you can just click on YouTube uh, for uh, five or computational physics at Rutgers. You're going to get it. Okay, so um, I'm going to discuss classical Monte Carlo. And uh, well, first, we're going to start with lecture notes on this uh, uh, random numbers and multidimensional Vegas algorithm. So the first subject uh, that we're going to discuss here is the, or well, the first thing that we're going to implement is Vegas algorithm, um, which is uh, probably one of better um, multi, uh, general purpose uh, algorithms for high dimensional integrals. So you have large dimensional integral, uh, the um, uh, Simpson or trapezoid drill will always, uh, will always get, well, will be too slow. Uh, and Vegas algorithm is probably the best choice. Um, now I provided you with source code in HTML form, uh, which you can click here, uh, but you can also go to, uh, uh, you can use the GitHub or can you, you can cl click here. Uh, I think right now the GitHub version and this one uh, on this website are exactly identical. So um, you could, um, yeah, so you, you, could, you, could, you could do either of the two. Um, yeah, so let me start with this uh, random numbers. Um, I'll use iPad now with this. Okay, so the first thing I want to warn you about is that um, on uh, uh, on classical computers we don't have a real random numbers. We always have pseudo random numbers, and therefore when uh, we are um, integrating something or uh, simulating something random uh, with uh, pseudo random numbers, it's very important to make sure that these um, random number generators are very high quality. Because otherwise, if they are not, if you have, um, uh, if these random numbers starts to repeat after a few billion uh, 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 samples, then your data will not uh, improve anymore. Uh, after running it for a long time. So it's not uncommon to run Monte Carlo simulation for several days on supercomputer. I mean, I do this pretty, pretty, uh, pretty often actually. So running uh, uh, the computer simulation uh, for several days on uh, thousands and thousands of nodes. And when you do that, you have to make sure that you don't start to um, um, that, that your random number generator is good, that it doesn't have a uh, small sequence of numbers because if it does, then you know after a uh, after a billion of uh, independent samples, you will go through exactly the same steps. Okay, and you're gonna basically wasting computer time. So there's a famous um, uh, famous story about um, 
uh, one simulation at CERN, uh, it turns out that in CERN, uh, they were simulating uh, some um, uh, uh, cross section, uh, uh, cross section uh, 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 probabilities and they spent uh, years of uh, accumulating Monte Carlo data. And it turns out that then they found that the random number generator was buggy and they had to throw away all this uh, uh, calculations. So it's important to uh, make sure that you're using random number generators, which are high quality. So one random number generator that uh, was uh, very uh, heavily tested is so-called uh, Mersenne Twister generator 19937. Uh, it's implemented in GNU Scientific Library, and it's also implemented in MKL Library, so 19937. Uh, there are other pretty good random number generators, but uh, this was uh, pretty well tested. Uh, I checked um, in um, Skype documentation just before, uh, before we, uh, I, um, we started this lecture, um, yeah, I don't know if I have it here. Turns out that, this, that the current implementation of, uh, of this random in SkyPy or NumPy actually uses um, slightly, uh, they, they say that it's slightly better than this 19937 uh, Mersenne Twister. So th they, they claim that this Mersenne Twister, which is kind of, uh, how can I say, state of the art, um, uh, has that there is another generator, random generator that was recently shown to be better than this. And so they use the next generation of that. Um, so uh, basically the, the, the point is that in um, uh, SkyPy, the random um, function has a very good random number generator. So this shouldn't be a problem. But when you use other uh, languages, you have to make sure that you use some uh, high quality random number generator. So C uh, unfortunately doesn't have such a great uh, random number generator by default. It uses a DRUNT, yeah, it uses this DRUNT 48, for example. So the DRUNT itself in C is pretty miserable random number generator, but DRUNT 48 is supposed to be slightly better. Uh, and basically SRUNT 48, I think is for in the integer, but DRUNT is for the double numbers. Um, this is reasonable, but it's not as good as, uh, as, as this, um, Mersenne Twister. So whenever I code my, my own stuff, I typically use GNU Scientific Library or MK, MK Library if available. And I use one of the best um, algorithm, one of the best random numbers from uh, MK Library or uh, GNU Scientific Library because these are better than, than the default ones provided by C. Um, now, uh, how, does, how do random number uh, generators work? Uh, well, of course, all the pseudo random numbers are deterministic in the sense that if you start with some uh, uh, random number A0, then you're going to go, which is called, usually called seed, num seed uh, then you're going to go for exactly the same sequence of random numbers every time you run a uh, random number generator. And uh, the simplest random number generators are have just a formula like that. So basically, here A is some constant, C is some constant, and M is some constant, and you do module of something. And so we see that basically the these numbers are very, very deterministic, have nothing to do with randomness. Well, it, it has very little to do with randomness, of course, but they appear as random to first approximation. Uh, now, of course, the more sophisticated random, random number generators have much more complicated formula, uh, and they um, they pass much more uh, much more, much more sophisticated tests for randomness. So there are lots of tests for randomness, and here is a website uh, which contains a um, large number of, of, of different tests that uh, good random number generators have to, have to pass. Um, and um, it's uh, uh, it's an interesting art by itself to um, uh, first. Uh, uh, produce good tests for random numbers and second test all these uh, uh, different gener random number generators to make sure that they perf perform well um, and don't fail any of those tests because if they do fail then we know that our uh, large body of, uh, of Monte Carlo data is probably uh, uh, not accurate. Okay, so the, the, the typical tests which are performed are, for example, random walk, distribution of points in a square and so on. 
uh, many, many other tests, but maybe random walk is the simplest uh, to understand. So I, I will I will sketch it here. So how does the random walk wor uh, works? Uh, so it is clear that the distance of a particle can travel by performing n random steps is proportional to square root of n. Uh, and most of good random numbers obey that constraint. So what do we do to test this property? So we can release a random walker from origin and measure the distance it reaches from the origin after i steps, where i is any number between on one and large n. It is clear that a single random walker will not end up at square root of n from the origin. However, if we avoid, we can avoid fluctuations if we uh, repeat random walk many times, or if we generate a very large random uh, set of random uh, walkers and make the average over all these random walkers. So this should give us a perfect screwed curve. So the what we do here is, is actually very simple. So we start with the random walker at the origin, and then we make steps left, right, up or down. Sometimes we go up, sometimes we go left, sometimes we go up, sometimes we go down and so on. So randomly uh, steps. So each, each step we can either go left, right, up or down, and the distance of the step is at most delta L, for example. I mean, there are various types of random walks, but I'm gonna demonstrate one, where basically uh, the delta XI at each step is equal to a uh, random number between minus one and one. So this one minus two XI, XI is between zero and one, and therefore this quantity one minus two XI is between minus one and one uniformly distributed. So this is uniformly distributed X between minus one and one and delta Y is uniformly distributed between minus one and one. And then um, we can, uh, of course, calculate what is the this, what is the uh, X component, uh, well, projection of your, uh, of the particle, uh, uh, particle uh, position after N steps. So projection to the X and projection to the Y. Um, and uh, then DN is the distance from the origin, okay? So distance from the R origin after, actually here it should be N, uh, distance from the origin after N steps is of course given by this, Xn square plus Yn square square root. And according to the central limit theorem, this um, distance from the origin when N is large, should go a square root of n times a number. And this number, of course, depends on the details of your algorithm. So for this algorithm that I sketched here, it turns out this number is 1.37748, uh, has is related to, to pi, and I think square root of pi over two or something like that. But this this details of this uh, of this number, of course, depend on the exact algorithm that, that you are making. Here my algorithm is such a way that uh, is such is such that uh, Delta xi is uh, around uniform distributed between minus one and one. Um, yeah. So what we need to do is we need to um, we need to first uh, throw away several ends. For example, uh, we throw away first um, uh, ten thousand uh, steps, and then from ten thousand on to let's say hundred thousand, we check whether the uh, uh, walker uh, is uh, square root of n divided by this number away from the origin. And we shouldn't do this for one random walker. We should do this for thousands of random walkers, okay? And then take the average, and then this the whole thing will, should go as square root of n, okay? Now, um, I have here a little code that I, uh, uh, that I created for this. So um, tests, so I'm doing here random walk, uh, test for uh, one of the, I think one of the worst random number generators, which is called BRUN. BRUN is actually a very simple one that I, uh, that I, um, it's one of the, uh, one of those, uh, let me see, do I know oh, what it is? Yeah, it's, as far as I know, it's one of the worst random number generators, just to demonstrate that uh, worst random generators might, might not work so well. And so, uh, random walk, what does it do? So just as, as I explained before, uh, the random number, the, so the, the X, the step in X direction is some constant DU, which is this number 1.37748 times a number which is between minus one and one. 
and then the distance, the, the step in the in y direction is, is also another random number between minus one and one times and times uh, number 1.377. We uh, we uh, calculate the the, dis the distance from the origin for the x component for the y component, and then we calculate the distance uh, from the origin the square root of the x square plus y square, and then we plot print this out. Uh, we print out the distance and we print out the expected distance. So square root of, uh, of i plus m1, where m1 is the number of steps that were skipped at the beginning. So we first skip m1 steps, and then we could record uh, the rest m steps, okay? And the question is, how close is this to, uh, to uh, square root? And uh, yeah, this takes just a second to execute. Um, and let's see. How good does it work? Oops, with points, we see nothing. But what if we do with lines? Okay, so, well, it's actually not bad this time. So uh, the, uh, the green curve here is uh, the expected screw root of n behavior. And uh, uh, the viola curve is uh, the data from this random number generator. Not every time is so great. I think if we if we execute this one more, then we might see slightly more um, deviation from this from this uh, square root square root of n. Yeah. So this one maybe is not so great because you see that at large n, you're supposed to be very close to square root of n, but it seems that deviation now becomes pretty significant. So um, basically, this is this is demonstration that. Um, Run, uh, random numbers sometimes are not are not perfect, and uh, the idea is that we need to be to make sure that we are using some of the state of the art random numbers in order to make our calculation precise. Okay, so um, now the most important subject of this uh, um, lecture is multi-dimensional integration. So high-dimensional integration, in particular, we want to. Uh, discuss um, Vegas algorithm. So, but before we go there, let's discuss um, uh, completely straightforward, um, uh, the, the most straightforward uh, algorithm, uh, which is uh, naive uh, Monte Carlo. So, uh, multi-dimensional numeric integration in more than four dimensions is more appropriate for Monte Carlo than one-dimensional quadrature. So, we, we see that in Skype we have uh, one dimensional, two dimensional, I think in even three dimensional integration that's implemented. Uh, but uh, as, you, as you saw in Skype, it doesn't support more than three dimensional integration. And there's a reason for it because it turns out that when you have uh, four dimensional integral or more, uh, usually uh, this quadrature uh, are not very useful. I mean, it's uh, very quickly you, um, uh, very quickly, you can see that uh, the uh, precision that you get uh, is much worse than uh, Monte Carlo. So basically, four dimension is typical breaking point where the Monte Carlo becomes becomes better than uh, using any any quadrature. Um, now, how do we see that? Um, well, uh, well, first, if the function is smooth enough. But we know how to transform the integral to make it smooth. The integration can be performed with Monte Carlo. The reason that Monte Carlo success, the reason for Monte Carlo success in larger dimensions, dimensions is that the error, according to the central limit theorem, is always proportional to one over square root of n, independent of dimension. So this is crucial. So the error of Monte Carlo is always one over square root of n, where n is the number of um, of uh, sampled uh, of the points. Uh, thrown into the into the volume. So we have some volume, you throw in n points, and the question is how big is the error? And well, it's one over square root of n, independent of how many dimensions this volume has, okay? Um, so now, how do we see that this is better than using um, uh, trapezoid rule uh, or Simpson's rule? Well, uh, this argument is done over here. So let's say, uh, let's first uh, check the uh, error using quadrature. So for the one-dimensional quadrature, 
uh, we know that if we have number of data points n1, then the number of all points used in d dimension is n1 to the power of d. Okay, so if we if we uh, have two dimensional integration, then the uh, if you're using each dimension n1 points, then in two dimension we need to use n1 square. In three dimension we need to use n1 to the three, of course. So number of points that we need is n1 to the power of d, where n1 is number of points in one dimension. The error of trapezoid rule is one over n1 square. So basically the idea is that uh, trapezoid rule uh, has error which is proportional to uh, delta h square, which is of course uh, equal to, it's proportional to one over n1 square, isn't it? Now, of course, for a Simpson rule, I think uh, is uh, the, the scaling is slightly better in the sense that this is delta h to the four, which is proportional to one over n1 to the four. Okay, but still the point is that uh, this um, uh, this precision is goes like that, and now um, in d dimensions we can of course we can now substitute this uh, n one uh, uh, n one in you can express n one in terms of n in terms of all the points in d dimensions, and then uh, if we substitute this here we see that this is this goes as one over n to the two over d. Okay, so now if d is four, we see that this um, precision is now one over square root of n. So we see that at four, at um, when um, we are in four dimensions, then the, the trapezoid rule and Monte Carlo uh, have scaled the same way. They both scale as one over square root of n. And if dimension is more than four, then trapezoid rule is going to be worse than. Uh, than Monte Carlo. Now, of course, um, this is when it comes to naive Monte Carlo. So um, it turns out that, of course, this is just the scaling. Uh, this ignores the prefactor. So the prefactor, if we are kind of intelligent, uh, we can make the prefactor uh, um, pretty good in, in Monte Carlo and uh, using uh, important sampling, for example, um, we can uh, we can make uh, four-dimensional integrals typically more efficient with Monte Carlo than uh, than uh, than with trapezoid rule. Uh, even though in this case it seems that they they uh, they scale the same way. And naively would say that Simpson's rule uh, would break even in uh, what is it uh, eight dimensions. But it turns out that uh, uh, Simpson's rule actually is not much better in four dimensions than Monte Carlo. So um the rule is that whenever we have four or more dimensions uh you should try monte carlo and probably you're going to be better off than with uh uh with uh with uh, with any other rule okay so now how does monte carlo work uh well uh, basically the, the naive monte carlo is completely straightforward completely simple you can implement it in no time so the if we are sampling um, if we are uh, estimating the integral of function f in some volume v, so we need to use f dv, so there is some complicated volume v, then we throw in uh, this volume uh, random numbers, which are uniformly distributed in this volume, then the value of the integral is basically the average value that we get when we throw in those uh, numbers times volume V, where the average is defined in the following way. So we, uh, this XI are, uh, are uh, uniformly distributed, uniformly distributed uh, points in volume V, okay? So xi, of course, they're multidimensional in the sense that they have they have uh, uh, n-dimensional components, isn't that? In four dimensions, you have uh, four components, but you can easily uh, uh, get a vector in n dimensions, isn't it? And which is uniformly distributed. 
uh, in uh, required volume B. So for example, it's easy to think of hyper hypercube, isn't it? So it's easy to distribute these points in hyper hypercube. And then you just evaluate your function uh, F in such a hypercube um, uh, and uh, check what is the average average value that you get after you uh, throw in a very large number of points. And then if you multiply this with volume, you get the value of the integral, okay? As simple as that, completely trivial. Now, uh, the, the nice thing about Monte Carlo is that it's very easy to calculate the error that you get with this. And the error is actually just the standard deviation of the function divided by square root of n. So according to central limit theorem, they should, we should always have the error of the Monte Carlo going to square root of n, isn't it? But the prefactor here, it's also given due to central limit theorem with just the uh, standard deviation of the function. Okay, it's sim as simple as that, times volume. Um, now, uh, the standard deviation is, of course, calculated in the usual way. So f square, you have to sample f square, you sample f, and then you take the, the difference between the two. So um, what does this tell you? Well, it tells you if the function is flat in the sense that f square uh, and average f square are similar. So in other words, the variation or variance of the function, this volume is small, then this, uh, this quantity is going to be small. And then um, if, large, if you have large number of points, you're going to have a small number divided by square root of n, n is large, the error is going to be small. Okay, and we're going to have a very precise value for our, for our integral. Okay, um, now um, the trouble is, of course, if the variance of the function is very large, then the prefactor is very large and the square root of n will not give us, well, then we need a very, very large number of data points. Otherwise, the integral would be wrong or have a large error bar. Um, so the, 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 all, the, all the trouble if in, in, in uh, implementing good uh, integrators is to reduce this variance, okay? So this prefactor is what we really care about. That's what we need to reduce as much as possible. That's the ultimate goal of this lecture and next, I don't know, several lectures, okay? How to reduce this variance to make the uh, prefactor in Monte Carlo as small as possible. So fundamentally, we cannot change the square root of n. That's, that's set. You can't do better than that. Well, there, there are some algorithms which use pseudo-random numbers that claim that they can get this slightly better for uh, integrals uh, which are uh, between, let's say, uh, 10, well, between integrals between four and uh, maybe 20, 30 dimensions. When dimension is very large, then there is no better way than this getting square root of n. But there are some intermediate dimensions in which it turns out that with some algorithms, quasi random number generators, you can get slightly better than that. Um, okay, so, um, well, one, one other thing that I uh, want to emphasize is that um, if volume V is not simple, if, it's, if volume V is, is hypercube, then uh, this algorithm is extremely simple uh, because it's very easy to generate uh, uh, uniform distributed points in hypercube, isn't it? Hypercube. So it's basically uh, the same as in one dimension, except that you have several of those. Uh, but let's say that the volume is not is not uh, hypercube, but it's some complicated shape um, that uh, you might not, not not be easy to specify. So then, how do you calculate the volume in this complicated shape? Well, the idea is very simple. So you basically um, um, you you find um, larger volume. Let me call it W, larger volume, which uh, um, which is simple. Let's say hypercube or hypersphere, hypercubes, hypersphere, or anything that it's easy to define. Uh, th then we sample the uh, points in a hyper uh, cube or hypersphere, simple volume, and then we define function to be zero outside, uh, to be outside our volume that we're interested in. So in other words, uh, we, um, let's say that we're interested in, in, in two-dimensional case, 
So let's say that we were we, we don't know how to uh, handle uh, how to handle square. No, how, how to handle um, a sphere? Uh, we can always find um, find um, a, a hypercube which contains the sphere, and then we can say that the function f is zero outside uh, the sphere, and uh, then throw the points into cube, um, and uh, then we are we are going to get, of course, the integral in the sphere. OK, so all we need to do is to define that f is zero padded. In other words, f is zero outside this particular volume. And let's say that the, for the for the complicated for the simple volume w, we, it's easier to handle it than for volume v. Okay. So it's a simple algorithm. Now, the trouble is, of course, that the uh, variance will increase because uh, the this variance um, or sigma uh, on w is going to be bigger then sigma on v, that's the that's the price that you pay because sigma means uh, the uh, sigma means uh, this um, uh, uh, this variance, isn't it? So uh, the, uh, the point is that you you're gonna if the function f is non-zero, which of course if it's zero we're we're not interested in. If function is non-zero, then we know that when you zero pad something, we're gonna increase the variance of the function. Uh, but the Hope is that this this volume here, the extra volume that we are adding, is relatively small, so that shouldn't be shouldn't affect the precision of the integral so much. Okay, but it's important to have the to have a simple uh, uh, volumes in which we can easily generate random uh, random numbers in that volume. Okay, so um, the the first uh, uh, the first Im uh, important ingredient in in our um, uh, search for uh, better uh, monte carlo methods is importance sampling importance sampling um, so the naive monte carlo that i just described here which is this okay um, is still um, is so simple to implement that sometimes if you have really a lot of resources available, you might still want to just uh, implement it and, and forget about it, submit to the, to the, to the, to the cluster and uh, see what the result comes out. Um, but um, in most of the cases, of course, we want to do better. And if you have some idea of how the functions look like, uh, we, can, we can do a lot better. Um, so we are going to be from now on. We are illustrate everything for one dimension, one D. Uh, but but um, we're going to write equations in such a way that their generalization to uh, hypercube is completely straightforward. Because in hypercube, uh, such an integral, of course, is just the product over each dimension, dx, dy, dz, and so on. So for hypercube, it's completely straightforward generalization, and so then if we zero pad our volume in a, in a large hypercube then generalization to, to any volume is also simple okay uh, of course if we want to generalize this to hypersphere it's a little it gets a little bit more complicated because um, uh, in spheres you uh, we then have to discuss of how do we generate the random numbers and what is the trial step probability but we're going to get this to to this uh, later on in the in the class um, okay, so the idea is the following. Uh, we are integrating here function f of x dx, uh, and uh, um, we, we want this function f to be um, very flat. But, well, if it's not, so what do we do? Well, we define another function w in such a way that f divided by w might be more flat, and then we multiply with w of x dx. Okay, so right now we didn't do anything. We divided by W and multiply with W. But the idea is that this part here is going to be flat or more flat. And then this is going to be volume matrix element. Okay, or basically a Jacobian. So in multidimensional case, this could be Jacobian. Okay, and this will be now our flat function. Okay, so now. Of course, not every W is good enough for that. 
So if we want to use Monte Carlo, then this W has to be positive. That's the constraint, has to be positive or, or positive or zero. Uh, just a second, zero. No, zero is not good either. So it has to be positive. Okay. So um, yeah, so W of X has to be uh, positive for every X. And if it's positive, we also can uh, normalize it. Actually, it turns out that uh, we should be able to normalize it. So the only the function the functions which we know how to normalize are useful for this case. But let's assume that for now W is some positive function. It's normalizable, uh, and then we basically change the variable. So the whole, the whole idea here is just like a change of variable integration. Okay, so we take this as our new integration variable. W of x dx is new new integration variable. F over W is then new function. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, this is now com uh, basically complete completely straightforward. Something that you learned in your basic algebra, how to change the uh, how to change the variable in integration, but it's kind of written in terms of Monte Carlo probabilities. So therefore, it might be might look a little bit tricky. So what do we do? Um, well, uh, we said that this function v uh, can be integrated. So v of t dt is uh, normalizable. We know that if we integrate it up to x is equal to um, to one, so up to no, uh, uh, I'm sorry, up to all the x. So if you go into uh, hypercube and we go from the beginning to the end of this variable x, okay, over the entire hypercube, then we should get we should get w to be one because the function the little w is normalized to one. Okay, now. If we take the derivative of this capital W, dW, then of course the, the derivative is the same as the V of x dx because we need to just insert, uh, we take the derivative with respect to one. When we take the derivative, basically we just insert the upper border into the function, doesn't it? So that's uh, according to the, to the um, definition of the integral. So dW is basically W of x dx. Then we can rewrite uh, f of x dx as the following f of w uh, f uh, of x divided by w, little w of x and then w of x to dx is now we see here it's d capital W. Okay, so we just substitute v of x dx with capital W and then um, we can express so assuming that we can express here. Uh, uh, so here we have this function is w as a function of x, but we can also invert this to get x as a function of w. If we know how to get x as a function of w, we can insert it here, and then we integrate over w. Okay, so then uh, we can say that we from now on we need to sample uh, sample w, which is w is uniformly distributed, and we need to evaluate this quantity. Okay, so we now just changed the original uh, integration in which we were sampling f dv into integration in which we are sampling f over w, where w is uniformly distributed. Okay, so it's pretty trivial. Now um, we can check what is the uh, error for this particular sampling, and obviously the error is. Uh, the flatness of f over w rather than f. Okay, so the error is standard deviation of f over w minus the what well, f over w squared minus uh, minus f over w squared divided by square root of n. Uh, and if f over w is more flat, then we achieved our goal. Okay. Uh, so of course this is still sl slightly complicated because we are we we have we are required to calculate x from w. So in other words, we have here we define here w of x, but then we need to calculate x as a function of w. Or in other words, what I wrote here x as a function of w is one one way to write is v inverse of r. Um, this might be um, challenging sometimes, but I mean for simple functions we can still do it. So let me show you some examples. Um, yeah, one way to write this is also to write it like this. So um, instead of writing 
that we need f over f over w where w is uniformly distributed and where we need x or w we can also write the same thing as f over w where the variable is written here as x but then the probability for x is small w of x okay that's exactly the same the same thing so this writing it this way or writing it this way it's exactly uh equivalent okay so why well because what is the probability for x this is the probability that we are going to see the point x the probability for x is the probability for distribution of probability with respect to w times this, uh, the probability distribution of w with respect to x isn't that that's just the usual chain derivative um, now the, the distribution with respect to w is uniform because the well that's what we said here w has to be distributed uniformly and if that's the case then dp over w is equal to unity okay because it's the 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 probability to get any w is the same for every w and it's exactly one so dp over w is unity and if dp over w is unity then dp over dx is d capital w over dx but we know that d capital w over dx is exactly small w okay so therefore we see that dp over dx is small w and therefore if we if we know that the probability for x is small w then we can just evaluate this quantity f over w on R, on each x so in other words the point is uh, when x is uniformly distributed we need to evaluate f of x only but if x is non-uniform distributed with some distribution w then we need to divide f with this w when we average over our volume okay very simple rule so in other words if our x is distributed non-uniformly with some distribution w then when we evaluate the integral we need to take the ratio of f and w okay that's all and we are we are we are um uh, this derivation shows that this is this this uh, is equivalent. Okay, so how do we implement this for simple cases? Well, um, the 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 Hayek example of exponential function is very uh, useful to uh, to walk through. So let's say that our distribution let let's say that we know that the uh, that our functions in hip hypercube uh, fall off uh, exponentially. With distance okay let's say that we know that uh that that our distribution is mostly concentrated around the origin uh with large weight but then when we go away from this they, they all all functions fall off exponentially so in this case it might be useful to um to change the variable or to weight the function with respect to those such exponents where lambda is arbitrary so for each dimension you can choose a different lambda okay um which might be most appropriate for for this dimension for this particular um, direction um, now uh, if this is your uh, small w of x you know we know that uh, well this function is norm is normalizes to one so if we integrate if we integrate v of x dx okay uh, from zero to infinity so from zero to infinity w of x dx we know that we get one, doesn't it? That's how this function was constructed. So then, uh, this dub, the capital W is the integral of this small W, and it's one minus e to the minus x over lambda. Okay, it's very trivial uh, integral. Uh, and then um, the nice thing about um, the nice thing about this uh, this uh, uh, simple exponent is that uh, the inverse is possible so if we if here we have w as a function of x we can also get from this x as a function of w okay and it turns out that x as a function of w is not too complicated it's only log or something okay so if that's possible then we can express instantly this x here in terms of w okay so we're inserting here and then we express w in terms of capital W, and then we integrate over dW. 
And then we see that this, this actually W, small w as a function of capital W, can, um, turns out to be one minus W. So we all you need to do is to integrate of this, we integrate function F uh, in, uh, so in terms of the variable W in this way. Okay, so we are we are now throwing in the way the way you should think of it that we are throwing in uh, the the points between we are throwing in w which is distributed uniformly between zero and one, and we are evaluating this function. Okay, instead of evaluating f itself, we have to evaluate this function, and we are we are then uh, uh, we know that this integral will converge to f of x dx. Okay, so in other words, the integral of x dx is going to be uh, all we need to do is we need to distribute w uniformly and evaluate this particular quantity. Now, of course, we could also write exactly equivalently this thing. We could say that we, we need to evaluate f of x divided by this exponent e to the minus x over lambda divided by lambda when uh, the probability for x is distributed uh, exponentially. Of course, this is just a different. This statement and that statement are equivalent. Okay, they're slightly differently written, but they're equivalent. Because it turns out this e to the minus x or lambda, e to the minus x or lambda divided by lambda, when distribution is like that, is exactly one minus w. Okay, now why did I do all these exercises? Okay, because sometimes you cannot invert the function so well in many most interesting cases this inversion is hard to do so if we know w of x it's very hard to get to x of w okay and when this is the case the second uh, form is much more useful than the first form because this is very hard it's very seldom that we can actually write in this form but in this form it's it's easier okay in this form it's much easier now uh, gaussian so let's say that your fun that you know that your functions are 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 peaked at some x zero. So of course this x zero um, is um, how can I say every dimension can have its own x zero. So in any dimension, you, of course you can always make a product of Gaussians for every dimension: dimension one, dimension two, dimension three. So uh, let's say that your distribution is peaked at some particular x zero and has some width sigma square. Uh, so such that uh, that uh, the function is going to be close to a Gaussian, or at least the first approximation Gaussian is going to be a good approximation, then uh, you might use distribution according to Gaussian. So you might throw the points in such a way that they are going to be Gaussian distributed. Okay. Then we know that f of x divided by the Gaussian. Uh, is gonna is gonna is gonna converge to the right answer, provided the the distribution of the points is Gaussian. Now the trouble is that when you try to do uh, this exercise that we've done before, namely if we try to integrate uh, Gaussian v of x dx um, up to x, let's say from minus infinity to x to get w of x, okay, this function w turns out to be uh, ERF function, isn't it? ERF function. Okay. And now, if you remember uh, from this uh, uh, special function uh, uh, about special functions, this ERF function is already very, very complicated. Okay. And then what we need to do is we need to do inverse of that. So we have ERF of X. And what we require is to get x as a function of w. So w is erf of x, and we need x as a function of w, which is the inverse of erf function. Uh, this is not tabulated. Okay, so we see now the, the little issue here, namely that um, uh, that, that this uh, original form here it's not useful, but this form here still can be used. It's not a problem. Why? Because all we need to do here is to distribute points according to the Gaussian distribution. But that might be easier than the inverting the function. Okay, Because one way to do the sampling is to invert the function, just like we did here. But we could we could get away even with this, even if we don't invert the function. 
Okay, so for the Gaussian distribution, so how do we do? Well, we do the following. Uh, we generate random numbers with this algorithm. So here in this algorithm, um, in this algorithm, uh, R1 uh, is random and it's between zero and uh, uh, I guess infinity, no, zero and one, sorry, zero and one. And also R2 is random number between zero and one. I guess it's like this, it shouldn't be one. Ah. Um, so it's random number between zero, including zero, but not one, I guess. Um, so now if it, it turns out that if we, um, if we evaluate this quantity here with R1 and R2 being distributed uniformly, uh, between zero and one, then the probability distribution of both X1 and X2 is exactly Gaussian. Okay, it's exactly Gaussian. And then we achieved our goal. So F of X dx, we evaluate instead of uh, F of X, we evaluate F of X divided by the Gaussian, and we know the distribution of points is Gaussian if we use this algorithm. Okay, so how do we know that? Um, that uh, distribution of points is going to be Gaussian. Well, uh, all we need to do is to calculate Jacobian. So the distribution of points with respect to x1, x2, x2 is distribution of points with respect to r1, r2 times Jacobian. So we need to change from variable r1, r2 into, into x1, x2. Okay, so this is Jacobian. And now how do we calculate Jacobian? Well, I mean, this is a simple algebra, how to calculate Jacobian. It turns out, something that we can easily do. We're all supposed to be able to do it. Uh, it's the Jacobian for this case is Gaussian. Is the product of Gaussians, okay? So- I may, don't... may I ask a question? Yes. Sorry. yes. Uh, so so if, if zero is included, if the point zero is included, but logarithm of zero is infinity, right? So it is not ill-defined. Right? Yes, yes. So what you just, I mean, when I was writing this, I was thinking that- uh, Oh, okay. Yeah, so this is what I'm supposed to do, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if 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 you have, I mean, the typical R1 in, on a computer is actually like this: zero and one, isn't it? One is not included, but zero is. So basically, what I need to do here to make sure that I don't have nuns, I need to do one minus R1. This is this is what what I'm should what I'm supposed to do when I implement this, isn't it? One minus R1 okay. because. The, if if R1 is distributed in this way between zero and one. So on a computer, uh, zero is allowed, one is not allowed, doesn't it? That's uh, um, all random number generators are like that. So therefore I need to use here one minus R1 to be, to be safe. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Important point. Okay, so with this I'm, I'm finished because we are, it's already more than 620. So uh, any other question? I have another question. Yes, please. So, so actually, the the, the Gaussian distribution is uh, like it can be like once you know that the, the random number is uh, the distribution of random number is Gaussian distribution, yes. it can be simulated. But uh, how about other distributions? Like, yeah. So, well, of course, th this is th this is what uh, Vegas is doing. So we will see in Vegas. Uh, we are going to have a generic one-dimensional, numerically given one-dimensional function, isn't it? So we're going to have uh, uh, what G1 function. Well, I'm just floating this too fast. So the point we're going to have some generic function, which is called F1 of X, okay? And we are, need to, we are going to need to distribute the points according to this function F1 of X, which is just given numerically. Okay. And uh, well, this is the algorithm. So well, that's what we're that's that's the subject of next of next next class, isn't it? Oh, oh, okay. To figure out to figure out how to get the uh, random numbers that are going to be distributed according to some numeric function. That's what Vegas is doing. I mean, the entire Vegas algorithm is, is exactly that. So you have some okay. generic. You basically what you do is you 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 get your you have your original function, you project it to to all the possible. Uh, 
uh, uh, all the possible uh, axes, x, y, z, and so on. And then uh, you, you distribute your uh, random numbers according to this uh, run according to the sample function. Okay. That's what, what Vegas is doing. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, by the way, can you go back to equation 10? Mm -hmm. uh, 10 or 11? I guess there was a typo. Yeah, it, yeah 11 in Gaussian distribution. I guess you miss a minus sign in the exponent. Uh, oops, Allah. thank you very much. Absolutely yeah. here. Yeah, 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 exactly. This would be Whoops. Yep, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other question? Okay, if no other question, then I, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop.